You're watching Tag TV News and Views, and today I'm having a candid talk with MP Gardner Genius. Welcome, MP Gardner Genius. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me today. You're always welcome, and uh, uh, you are doing impressively good. Thank you. For uh, human rights and uh, for other causes. So, election is just mm -hmm. around the corner. Yes. Time flies. Five months from now, nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you are very active in Conservative Party, not just MP uh, from the West. So what do you see, uh, what are your hopes in terms of uh, winning next election mm -hmm. by your party? Well, the next election is uh, a clear choice. Uh, we have Prime Minister Justin Trudeau on the one hand, and uh, I think uh, a lot of high rhetoric and promise going into the last election, uh, but now people are seeing that he uh, he has not delivered on that promise. He hasn't been uh, what people had expected, and you know it's the scandals, but it's also the the high deficits. Uh, it's the the failure to bring people together. Actually, more more divisiveness, uh, mismanagement of of our immigration system. Lot, lots of issues. Uh, and then the alternative is uh, is Andrew Scheer and the Conservative Party. And uh, the last few months, uh, the news has really been dominated by discussion of uh, of the liberal scandals. Uh, but now, more recently, uh, Andrew has started to come out and articulate a, a positive, constructive vision of the country. Uh, and he's he's doing that at, at this stage through a series of five keynote speeches. And then there'll be more detail released as we get into the fall into the platform. Uh, so he's delivered speeches on foreign affairs and on uh, on the economy and then upcoming ones will be on the environment on immigration and on federalism and this is part of the the my vision for Canada series so uh, I think people are seeing uh, that Andrew is thoughtful substantive uh, and uh, I mean just just to touch on uh, what was just discussed the the speech you just gave uh, on the economy uh, in terms of the economy we're seeing how Trudeau's mistakes are costing people more and uh, Andrew Shear's focus is on helping people get ahead. I, I talk to a lot of people in this region, other parts of the country. Uh, people are getting by often, but they're not necessarily getting ahead because higher taxes are making it harder for them to, to get ahead. Uh, and so we have committed to get rid of the carbon tax, to, uh, to, to go further, to take the, ta the GST off home heating, uh, take other steps to make life more affordable and help Canadians get ahead. So, uh, so that is the choice. It's between uh, two different visions, uh, two different leaders, and, uh, and and I'm excited about the argument we're going to be able to put to Canadians uh, on so many issues that uh, that on the one hand, with the Liberals, it is it, it, they're not getting what they were promised. They're they're paying more. Mistakes are costing them. And on the other hand, we have a vision to help people get ahead. So despite all those scandals uh, mm -hmm. of Liberal government, uh, mainstream press uh, critics say that so far conservatives are not able to materialize. So how would you respond? Well, uh, I think things are, are going very well for us. I think there's a, there's a, a, a very strong trajectory uh, towards the fall that uh, you know fir first starts with articulating what the problem is and then uh, you know now we we are uh, putting a, a strong emphasis on on offering the solution and the alternative uh, and what our what our uh, public opinion conversations what our data is showing us is that a very large number of Canadians are looking at the Conservative Party uh, if you look at the polls we're ahead uh, but but outside of the polls the people that are thinking about voting conservative is is again larger than it's ever been before so we've got a real opportunity uh, but it's far from over yet this is going to be a very competitive election notwithstanding the liberal scandals uh, Justin Trudeau started the the, the uh, started his his term of government very very popular um, and you know there's there's a, a lot of institutions that are on his side. It's very rare for a first-term majority government to be defeated. Uh, if you look at Canadian history, uh, but we're going to do it this time, absolutely. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, if you just look at the historic trend lines, it's, it's not going to be automatic one way or the other. It's going to be a competitive election, but I, I like our chances. As some other critics say that uh, conservatives uh, are towards more center-left 
How would you respond to this allegation? I don't, I, I don't think that's the case. It's not something that I, I hear very often, frankly. I mean, I think that uh, our, our approach is to, uh, uh, is, to, is to stick to our conservative principles, uh, but also to do more uh, outreach and engagement to work to explain to people why we have those values. This is something that Andrew talked about a lot during the leadership race and, and, and continues to. The idea that as conservatives we have to talk about why. We have to talk about what's in our head but also what's in our hearts. We have to explain uh, what our motivations are and we have to finish the sentence so to speak. So we want balanced budgets. Why do we want balanced budgets? Because if you have a balanced budget then you can invest for the long term in, in uh, things that allow people to get ahead. If you spend money without a balanced budget that's going to lead to cuts. But if you make investments within the framework of a balanced budget plan then people can have certainty and confidence in, in, in those things. Uh, we we want to help people get ahead. We want to have a fair immigration system. Why do we want to have a fair immigration system? Because if the system is fair, if people have confidence in it, then we are more able to help the truly uh, most vulnerable. If people are walking across the border uh, illegally, uh, then that's not fair to those that are some of the most vulnerable in the world aren't able to do that. So uh, we, we need to explain the policy, whether it's you know securing the border, balancing the budget, uh, but we need to explain why we're going to do that as well and, and reach out to people who might not have thought of themselves as conservatives before to make that argument. But does, is making that argument a watering down? I don't think so at all. I think that's, that's kind of an, an outreach and an explanation, but that's rooted in conservative principles. So uh, you talked about immigration. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Scheer openly opposed UN impact yes. uh, on immigration. So what is up to conservatives now? Are they having same position about UN impact? So, so uh, conservatives oppose the uh, Canadian Canada signing on to the UN migration pact, and and uh, uh, you know I think. There's some there's some different discussion about what the significance of that pact would be or not, and uh, you know we have to be very clear that uh, Canada sh ha has historically had a very effective immigration policy. It's it's been weakened by the Liberals, but but historically we've had a strong, open, compassionate, effective immigration policy that's been uh, developed here in Canada, and uh, it, it you know it, it is it is formally the case that this migration pact is is non-binding. But the fact is, why would we sign on to something that starts us down the road of of uh, suggesting that immigration policy should somehow be an agreement among uh, a, a multitude of different countries? We should be setting our own immigration policy here in Canada that reflects our values and reflects our interests. I think most people can understand you know why why that's important. Uh, when it comes to our immigration policy, we are a party that is pro-immigration, uh, that uh, has a history of welcoming uh, very high numbers of people to come to Canada through legal channels, uh, and of welcoming Canadians from all over the world on an equal basis, regardless of, uh, of background, uh, regardless of country of origin, regardless of faith, etc. Uh, but, but the emphasis has to be on, on legal, on proper channels. Uh, and uh, you know, on, on using our our uh, reason as well as our, our emotion, we can we can use our hearts and our heads at the same time. We can say, you know, hey, is it? it it's not very sensible to have people coming across the border illegally from a safe country claiming asylum, and then to take years and years and years to process those asylum claimants. What makes more sense is let's lift the cap on private sponsorship of refugees so that we can take more of, of the world's most vulnerable, but that those who come, come into existing sponsoring communities where they're receiving support, assistance with integration, uh, you know, we can, we can leverage those strengths to help more people actually. Uh, as long as we, again, match our head with our heart, we can, we can achieve these things uh, and clean up the mess that the Liberals have left in place. So MP Garnett, you happen to be on front line in terms of opposing M103 mm -hmm. because it uh, uh, affects our freedom of expression rights. Uh, what would be the position of conservatives in terms of uh, opposing this motion or if it becomes a bill at a later stage? Mm -hmm. uh, if you guys take over office mm -hmm. in next election after next election. Yeah. You know, it's it's a very important issue. Uh, the whole the whole space around 
yeah, w w how these issues are discussed. And, and uh, so M103 was a motion, uh, and a lot of people had concerns about the implications of it in terms of, well, am ambiguities around what was really meant by the word Islamophobia. Um, we, we believe very strongly that, uh, that anti-Muslim bigotry uh, should be condemned. Uh, but we also believe that it's important to allow dialogue and criticism uh, and, and, and back and forth about religious ideas. And of course, some of that criticism and dialogue happens internal to, to religions. We had, I, I spoke with people from the Muslim community who were concerned about how criticisms they might have of, of certain abuses within their own faith might lead them to be labeled uh, in, in a certain way. So, uh, so, so we are against bigotry and we're in favor of dialogue. And uh, so M103 passed, it's a motion, it doesn't have any legislative effect. Uh, but I think a lot of the discussion was, okay, well, what, what is the next step uh, going to be? And, uh, you know, as, if conservatives are in government, uh, we, will, we will oppose bigotry and we'll defend people's freedom to, to have, uh, have open dialogue. You know, the irony I'll say about the Liberals' approach is that, on the one hand, while they were, they were talking so much about the climate of hate and fear and all this, uh, they actually tried to repeal a section of the criminal code that specifically protected houses of worship. So it was it, it was a criminal offense uh, to uh, to to attack or disrupt a, a particular offense, uh, a, a, a worship service. Now, some of the language used in that section was I mean somewhat dated. It used language like a, a clergyman things that that. Are, but, but the implication of that section was very clearly applied to, to all different uh, faith systems. So the Liberals tried to repeal that. We were vocal in opposing it, and we were able to, uh, to get them to change course on it. Um, so, so it is interesting, uh, the, the kind of in, insincere, insincerity, inconsistency that we see from them. Uh, we are seeing uh, more incidents around the world of houses of worship, churches, synagogues, mosques being targeted for violence. So we need to be concerned about about bigotry and violence. But I don't think, uh, you know, I, I don't think a heavy-handed limit on free speech is the way to do that. You also happen to be on front line for the rights of Chinese Muslims. Liberal government uh, uh, opposed. Uh, China on certain human rights issues. Mm -hmm. So do you think uh, Liberal government did enough in terms of challenging human rights abuses in China? Uh, do they need more to do? Well, it's been very interesting to see the trajectory of the Liberals with respect to the relationship with China. They came in very naive. And uh, Trudeau, uh, had before he was elected, he had praised China's basic dictatorship. and. Uh, I mean, let's think about what that basic dictatorship means. We're, we're in the, the month of Ramadan right now, uh, and uh, th that basic dictatorship means uh, Muslims in, in certain parts of China prevented from fasting, uh, right? I mean, that's, that's the kind of heavy-handed implication of a basic dictatorship, uh, as Trudeau, uh, Trudeau talked about it. It's not, uh, it's not some glorious, uh, you know, everybody's happy moving forward. No, not, not at all. It means the repression of of Muslims, of Christians, of Falun Gong practitioners, of Tibetan Buddhists, uh, of, uh, of many different, different communities. Uh, so uh, we have spoken out about those issues consistently. We've called for Canada's engagement with China to reflect our values and our interests. Uh, the Liberals were trying to cozy up to China uh, in, this, in this naive way, uh, seeking free trade and even being open to an extradition agreement with China, it seemed. Um, and obviously we're in a different place right now because uh, China kept pushing and kept pushing and, and, and ultimately uh, Canada had to say thus far and no further, right? Uh, but we're still not being strong enough, whether it's defending our values or defending our interests. We need to speak out about these human rights issues. We also need to challenge uh, China's uh, attacks on our farmers uh, through the WTO. Uh, we need to uh, use the tools that are available to us to do this. We need to appoint an ambassador to China. We talked about what we're, we're saying or not saying on human rights or trade with China. We don't have an ambassador because the Liberals uh, used the, that post as a patronage appointment for John McCallum, former Liberal cabinet minister. And then he went uh, kind of way off base on, on certain things, uh, undermining Canada's position during a very sensitive time in the relationship. And uh, so, 
so they've they've bungled the relationship with China from start to finish, and uh, being consistent, being tough, being clear about our values and our interests uh, is something that uh, that we need to get back to. And of course, part of this as well is, is recognizing that uh, you know we we can we, we can do a lot better focusing on building relationships with like-minded democracies in the region. Uh, there are there are many democracies throughout throughout the the Asia Pacific Indo Pacific region. Uh, they're not always as united with each other as they could be, and I think Canada can can play a role promoting trade and greater cooperation among like-minded countries in the region. Um, you know, we, we, we have long-standing alliances with free democracies uh, here in North America and Europe, uh, but we need to look at expanding those partnerships to include democracies in other parts of the world. And what would be your take on a strained relationship between Canada and Saudi Arabia? Hmm. Well, we need to be clear and principled in talking about human rights, and that includes uh, recognizing the the realities of Saudi Arabia's human rights record, and, and, and we've been very open and, and critical of, of, of those human rights abuses. And uh, I mean, one example of this is you know, Saudi Arabia being elected to the UN Women's Rights Commission, and I called on our foreign minister to, to come out and, and speak about, about the reality of that, the, how, how just terrible that is. Um, and she wouldn't do it. So, supposed feminist foreign policy, uh, and yet we're we're not uh, pointing out the absurdity of Saudi Arabia being in a leadership position on on women's rights at the UN. Uh, so, so, so we need to be talking about human rights with Saudi Arabia. I think, um, you know, the 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 challenge in terms of how we engage on human rights is always, you know, what's what's the best way to work with existing governments is challenging them in a public way or is trying to work with them to to bring about changes in a gradual way um, you know frankly I, I think a lot of people right now are disappointed with by the fact that what seemed a few years ago to be the possibility of reform in Saudi Arabia uh, did did not and is not really materializing in the way people people expect so uh, I think you need to have every every tool in the toolbox and uh, uh, so uh, you know, after the next election, if we're in government, we have to look at where things are at uh, and figure out the right balance between uh, public criticism and constructive engagement. Uh, and, and that goes with, with Saudi Arabia, with China, with, uh, with anyone else. In, in some cases, you know, the constructive engagement piece isn't, isn't going to go anywhere, but in some cases it's a possibility. So that's, that's the calibration we always have to figure out. During the previous conservative government, Harper regime had a very good relationship with India. Mm -hmm. But we see those relationships yeah. going down, particularly in uh, Mr. Trudeau's regime. Yeah. Uh, so also there were a couple of uh, incidences uh, uh, I would like to point uh, one over here. Even conservative Senator Salma Taulajan invited uh, Indian separatists in one of the uh, event, and sh she clapped what she did. So what do you see that, uh, what kind of relationship would be between India and Canada if conservatives make ne next comment? Yeah, well, you're right to point out we had a constructive relationship with India in the past, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I think uh, that relationship is, is critical, is filled with lots of opportunities for us. Uh, and uh, that also doesn't mean that we're going to agree all the time, right? So one area you, you kind of alluded to in your question is the fact that, uh, you know, in, in Canada, people have the freedom to, uh, to advocate separatism. And, and they have the freedom to do that here in Canada. We have Quebec separatists that sit in our parliament, right? Uh, and so it's important for us to always distinguish between those that, you know, maybe peacefully advocating different political political arrangements, I, and I disagree with those people. But but right. we, we need to distinguish between that and uh, no, no, that's and, and violence. So yeah. that's why we respect people's uh, uh, sort of uh, free yeah. rights to express their yeah. opinion. But but when conservative senator claps for that kind of field, 
Well, I, I, I don't know the, the particulars of the, of the incident. So, so uh, I mean, I can't speak to, you know, what she may or may not have been clapping to, whether there was a, you know, a, a misunderstanding or, or something about the tape. So, you know, our, our, our party is very clear that we're, that we support a united India. And, you know, for the same reasons that we support a united Canada, because although Canada is, is uh, blessed with rich diversity, uh, that, we, that we feel that that diversity can be well reconciled uh, within a within a united country that, that respects that difference but that brings everybody together and uh, so so we're supportive of, uh, of of a united India and and at the same time we're supportive of people's freedom to have a different opinion um, and so uh, you know I think when Stephen Harper was in India uh, he was very clear about this point and he was he was asked these questions and and he he was pursuing greater commercial engagement with India uh, they were having you know discussions about Indian pluralism and uh, you know there's 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 good opportunity to have dialogue about kind of Indian pluralism and Canadian pluralism and what can we learn from each other and what are human rights challenges that both countries face I think I think that dialogue is is very constructive um, and, but he was asked directly by the Indian media and he and he said look we um, we support a United India, and we believe in people's freedom to express their opinions if they don't agree with that position. And uh, and that was clear, and that and that clear principled articulation of our position did not get away with, in the way of the relationship. I mean, the, the bigger issue with Trudeau in India is that uh, he he did not demonstrate uh, a sense of the seriousness with which that relationship should be taken. Uh, it was a very political trip. There was uh, a lot of emphasis on photo op as opposed to on substance. And uh, you know, in India is India is not uh, just a Bollywood set, right? It's a, it's a, a substantive, serious country uh, where there's a lot of economic opportunity for Canada, and uh, and also you know we, we should pursue trade negotiations, recognizing that sometimes we have divergent interests and we can negotiate uh, on on those points. But uh, but that engagement is important, and and uh, I mean, look, over over five percent of our our population ha traces its origin uh, to to that region of the world. So. Uh, we should be doing more in partnership and uh, looking for those opportunities. In the end, our viewers would like to know how well conservatives are prepared for next election and uh, how well they are prepared to run the next government if they mm -hmm. win the election. Well, I, I think we're, we're very well prepared for both of those steps. We have a, we have a strong team, uh, strong team in caucus, a lot of people with experience in government, of course. Uh, we have a, a very strong shadow cabinet. And uh, I've been really impressed by the people coming forward to run for us. Uh, I know in, in my region, uh, Tim Upple, former cabinet minister, is coming back and running again. Uh, we have someone who was the executive director of the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we have people with backgrounds in, in media, in uh, competitive sports, in, in very successful business, uh, former politicians, politicians from the provincial level. Uh, and, uh, and if you look at our candidate slate as well, are really reflective of the diversity of, of, of this country uh, and, and uh, uniting together uh, in, in support of conservative values. So I think we'll have a very good mix of existing, returning uh, elected officials, but also new people. And, uh, and we need to get the country back on track. I mean, it's, at the end of the day, it's not about us. It's about the people who, who are struggling to get ahead, who, who want more from their federal government and uh, we need to be ready to deliver for them. Thank you very much, MP Gardner. Thank you. I really Always appreciate it for your time. Viewers, you are watching my candid talk with MP Gardner.